So welcome to Tuning In, Reducing Stress and Anxiety Through Music and Mindfulness. I'm Christine Benjamin, the Breast Cancer Program Director at SHARE. SHARE is a nonprofit organization that's been helping people through breast and ovarian cancer for the last 42 years by offering the support of those who've been there. SHARE offers many services, including a helpline, telephone and in-person support groups, and educational programs. All services are free of charge to participants. For more information, visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. So I'd like to introduce our presenter, Maya Benatar. Maya is a certified music therapist and licensed creative artist therapist in private practice in Midtown Manhattan. She specializes in working with women who are dealing with anxiety, perfectionism, or relationship struggles through a creative and embodied approach to therapy. Through her work, women learn to be gentler with themselves, slow down meaningfully, and connect deeply with their creativity and power. Maya is passionate about music, mindfulness, and messy play as ways to feel connected and calm amidst our busy lives. She also provides supervision, consultation, workshops, and retreats for helpers and healers. Hey Maya, welcome. Hi. Thanks for coming to share. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about what you do. Sure. So like you said, I am a music therapist. I'm also a licensed creative arts therapist, which is a psychotherapy license in New York State. And so I work primarily with women who are dealing with anxiety, perfectionism, um, trauma, and, and sometimes that can come from a cancer diagnosis or from health concerns. And so I'm really, I really love the work that I do, and I use music and the creativity and mindfulness to help women slow down, to root in, to really find a place of calm within themselves, which in New York City, or really anywhere, is a difficult thing to do sometimes. And so once we can find that place of calm, then we can work on what's going on with the anxiety, what's really happening, what changes would they like to make. And so it's really deep and rewarding work. So Maya, I'm going to be asking you some questions from the audience. Sure. Um, however, I'm having some difficulty locating those questions at the moment. So you know, tell us what a, a typical session might be with someone. So the best answer that I can give to that question that there, is that there is really no typical session. Um, everyone is different. Everyone comes in with different concerns. As far as a loose structure um, with the women I work with, we might, and I tend to, do tend to work long term, so forming long term relationships that develop and keep developing over time. Um, it's, I always say that it's not for me to dictate, okay, we have to do A, B, and then C, and that I'm the expert and that they're just kind of being complicit. Um, part of a good therapy relationship is having a mutual relationship. So sometimes, to, to start a session, I might say, okay, what's been going on since last week, right? Just kind of pick up where we left off. Um, certain clients, I develop routines for, for starting and ending. So certain clients, I might know that they like to start not with talking, but with maybe listening to a piece of music, something to help them transition from work or from outside into my office. Um, and we go from there. So sometimes a session might have a lot of talking Sometimes a session might have much more music and creativity if they're feeling like they really need to slow down and root in. And, and so I'm really flexible um, with what each session looks like because it's not about what I think should happen, but about what the client's needs are in the moment. So if something has come up, if it's not at all where we ended last week, that's fine, we deal with it. And so it might mean that we are listening to music. It might mean we're doing some music and mindfulness exercises like I can demonstrate today. It might mean we're kind of diving deep into some advanced um, vocal psychotherapy techniques or improvisation, just exploring different emotions and relationships through music, through play. So that kind of answers your question. There isn't really a, you know, a typical session looks like this one thing because it just, I work in a really individualized way. So there's a question here, are, are the benefits more emotional or physical? So the benefits can be both. I mean, music is processed in a very physiological way, right? If, we think of, if you think about music that you enjoy, whatever that might be, 
chances are you feel a shift in your body physically when you listen to something that you enjoy or something that you don't, right? If we hear music, we have a physiological response, whether that's we feel more grounded, we start to dance, we, our breath gets deeper. So music is processed across pretty much every domain. It's processed physically, it's processed neurologically, emotionally, um, it is a social bonding mechanism. And so it's not for me to say, you know, it's just physical or just emotional. Um, it can be both because music as one of the primary ways that humans have communicated their emotions since really since the beginning of time, it's processed on a variety of levels and felt on a variety of levels. So just to backtrack a little bit, how did you become interested in this field? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, yeah, I have always had a really strong relationship with music. I grew up in a really musical family. Um, my maternal grandfather was a cantor and an opera singer and a Holocaust survivor, and music was really meaningful for him. And really, music is just part of my family. My parents are musical, my brother is musical. And so I guess the short-ish answer to your question is that I was involved with music from a young age. I took piano lessons, I took voice lessons, I took, I was in, you know, musicals in school, all that, all that kind of stuff. I wanted to do something with music when it, I was in high school and I was thinking, you know, what do I want to do? And I didn't really have the awareness at the time, but music was such a safe place for me. I was an incredibly shy teenager and child painfully shy. I couldn't ask the kid in front of me, you know, in math class to borrow a pencil, but I could get up and sing in front of 200 people without a problem. A little bit of stage fright, but without really a problem. Um, and so music was a place, was a way that I felt confident and secure, and that was really big. And so when I started thinking about what I wanted to study um, in undergrad, I wanted to do something in the helping professions. My mother is a social worker, and so that, of course, I think influenced my decision. And I was doing literally an AOL search, um, which is somewhat dating me a little bit. But I was doing an AOL search, and I wanted to do something with music. I did not want to study performance. I didn't really love practicing, much to the chagrin of my voice teacher in high school. And I stumbled upon music therapy. And for reasons I can't explain from my 17-year-old self, I just knew it was a good fit, and so I went to SUNY New Paltz for, specifically for the undergrad program in music therapy, and that was that. Very interesting. Um, is there a particular type of music that's commonly used with your clientele? Maybe is there a type of music that works better with mindfulness? or? So that's kind of two different questions. Maybe I could speak to them separately. Um, as far as a type of music that works for mindfulness exercises, yes, there can be. There's always caveats to this because everyone has their own musical experiences, their own lived experiences. So what one person finds super relaxing, another person is gonna be crawling out of their skin. Um, but let me kind of separate this out. So for music and mindfulness exercises, Often it can be instrumental music um, allows kind of a deeper connection to the breath, to the present moment. That's not a hard and fast rule, but lyrics do add another layer. So if we're talking about songs versus instrumental music, there's a big difference. Lyrics add another layer. They kind of um, engage our cognitive processes and they're really evocative. So that's songs versus instrumental music. As far as genres, I don't so much subscribe to the, you know, Bach is more relaxing than Motown or whatever it is. Um, everyone is different. What, and, um, and there's a story I can share about that actually, but really it's about what each person finds relaxing. And so for some people that's they need in order to get in the flow to, to be able to be mindful, and I can backtrack and talk a little bit about how that shows up in my work, mindfulness. Uh, it needs to be something that just feels good for them. And so for some clients I work with, they don't really know what that is, or they're dealing with preconceived ideas of, you know, this peaceful piano station should be relaxing, but it's making me more anxious. As far as music in general within music therapy sessions, outside of just music and mindfulness, so that's kind of a small subset of what I do, 
I work with clients who have just huge variety of musical tastes. And so a lot of times, often, always, it's about starting with the music that's meaningful to my clients because that's their connection to themselves, to their inner world. And we have to start there. And so based on you know where, how old my client is, where they grew up, what they listen to, that could be anything. And so if it's a style that I don't know or I'm not familiar with, I'll ask them to teach me. Um, I've had clients teach me songs and languages I don't know. Uh, we listen to stuff. I mean, the internet is a fantastic tool for this. So we'll YouTube stuff. We'll look it up on Spotify. Um, there isn't one specific type of music that's used in music therapy. I think that kind of answers both streams of that question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So would you be willing to demonstrate something for us, maybe some mindfulness sure. and music? Techniques or yeah, so there's a few different techniques that I can demonstrate, and I talk about mindfulness. If people aren't familiar with mindfulness, um, John Cabot Zinn might be a good person to look up. He's considered the father of modern American mindfulness, and he has written oh, done a ton of research since the 70s, written research podcasts. He's just all over the place, and he talks about mindfulness as this process of being with the present moment. Um, non-judgmentally and so mindfulness is about noticing what's going on at the present moment and accepting it as much as we can so a lot of times people confuse mindfulness and meditation and they're different they can be combined but they are different and so you can be mindful when you're doing something when you're doing anything um, and so mindfulness of our breath mindfulness of our body mindfulness of our thoughts and so a really quick exercise that I often will do with clients is based around this idea that we are essentially musical beings. Everything in our body, everything in the way we move, the way we talk is rhythm. So just sit with that for a moment. Everything is rhythm and so in a greater sense everything is music. And so a good way to pause and slow down a little bit is to just start checking in, tuning in, which was, I believe was the title of this Facebook Live. And so just to take a moment and tune in and allowing yourself to notice your breath. So we're always breathing, but we're not really thinking about it. Just noticing the rhythm of your breath, the inhale and the exhale. And then noticing your body so really taking stock of wherever you are. For myself, I'm just noticing the feeling of this chair underneath me, that my left foot is on the floor, my shoulders are gently dropped. It doesn't mean I don't have physical tension, I do, but it means that I'm really some kind of settled down into this moment. And then, and sometimes the hardest for people is tuning into your thoughts. So your thoughts, your mind, that can have a rhythm as well. So just noticing. Sometimes I'll say just noticing like you would notice clouds moving across the sky, waves on the ocean. Just allowing yourself to notice. So really tuning in to breath, to body, and to mind. And often that's a really good place to start. Someone is asking, do you help clients design a music playlist or CD when they are not in session with you? And if you do, do you include your voice on the CD? This is a great question. Um, I have done that with clients. Part of, for a lot of my clients, part of what I do with them is figuring out how they can hold on to the work we do in session from week to week, right? Because if you have a, you know, ideally deep transformative experience with me, how are you gonna hold on to that? And so yes, I do, I will work with clients around, okay, you know, this feeling of calm, this is just an example, this feeling of calm you found today, um, this deepened breath, this you know relaxed state in your body, how can we help you hold on to it? And they might say, they might have ideas, they might say, oh, I wanna to listen to that piece of music you played. Or maybe I'm going to tone, which is something else I can demonstrate. And so I will, yes, absolutely, I will help clients figure out like what can I do? And so sometimes, and we try to make it as simple as possible, right? I don't send people home with a 
three-hour playlist and say you need to listen to this every night um, because that's just not realistic. So yes, I help people figure out what they can do in small little bits. And so maybe that's one song, maybe that's a breathing exercise. I do have a YouTube channel, so sometimes I'll remind clients that if my voice in particular is helpful, that they can go on there. It's a public channel, they just search my name. They can go on there and find videos. Um, there's a breathing one on there, there's guided imagery, I believe there's a humming one. And so that's a way that um, they can kind of have a connection with my voice during the week. I've had clients that they want to record me uh, saying something, and so we'll do that. Again, technology is useful. So it really depends on the client and what they what they came in for and what they want to work on. Great question, thank you. So you talked a little bit about when you were speaking of mindfulness, you were talking about noticing your thoughts mm -hmm. and not being judgmental around that, right? <laughs> so yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then I want to ask you another question mm -hmm. about dealing with anxiety totally. and fear that comes up with a lot of cancer patients. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm glad that you asked because this idea of mindfulness, particularly around our thoughts and our minds, is the hardest for most people. And so I can't tell you how many people I've worked with, either individually or in workshops, who say, I can't empty my mind. I can't stop thinking, or some variation of that. And, and the idea behind mindfulness is that that's okay. You don't have to. And actually, the more that we struggle against the thoughts, the more that we push against them or try to defend against them, the harder we make it for ourselves. Because think about it, if you are in a somewhat relaxed state and then you notice the thoughts popping up, right? It's kind of like popcorn or whatever image works for you. And you're trying to get rid of them. Even when I went like this, all of a sudden there's this physical tension of like, oh crap, I'm thinking. Um, and so the idea in mindfulness, and you'll find this in a lot of uh, mindfulness-based relaxation, <clears throat> excuse me, scripts and um, you know YouTube videos, is not to stop thinking, but to practice a little bit of non-attachment, which is really hard. <laughs> so to notice, okay, there's a thought, it's passing me by, and to give yourself permission, and for a lot of us that is the hardest thing to do. But it really is about giving yourself permission of, oh, I'm thinking, okay, I come back to my breath. I come back to my body, okay, there's a thought. And that's why I work a lot with imagery because we, we tend to just gravitate towards something that's a little less cognitive based, right? A lot of us live in our heads and I include myself in that. And if we can make it a little less cognitive, a little more felt, it can be really useful. So this idea of you're gonna have thoughts and I'll say that when I'm talking someone through, you know, a personalized guided imagery script, I'll say, you're gonna have thoughts, that's okay, that's natural. The idea is to let them move. And so whatever imagery works, whether it's every time you exhale, you're releasing the thoughts, and, or picturing the thoughts like clouds moving across the sky, waves on the ocean, they're gonna come, they're gonna go. This idea of something that moves rather than each thought is a, I don't know, a boulder something static. We want movement and so over time the more you practice it, it, it is possible to have those you know meditation or those mindfulness sessions where you realize oh there's actually some clarity, there's actually some calm in my mind and that's a beautiful thing. So for, for cancer patients who often experience a high level of anxiety and fear, depression sometimes, how could they use this technique in their, in their daily lives, right? I mean, with a cancer diagnosis comes fear, Absolutely. comes anxiety, that's probably gonna be with someone now for the rest of their lives, right? And it can become very intrusive, yep. and it can really take over people's lives. So how can they use mindfulness to help control that? Yeah. And, and does mindfulness have to be practiced in a session, like, okay, I'm gonna sit down with a therapist or right. by myself, and now I'm gonna be mindful. No, not or, at all, <laughs> not at all, that's a great question. Um, the first thing I wanna notice is that even in what you were saying, like how can people use mindfulness to control? And so the idea is that mindfulness is not about control. As much as when there's fear and anxiety, of course we wanna control things, right? We wanna know the outcome. And a cancer diagnosis makes that all the more prevalent. You wanna know what's gonna happen. 
And sometimes we can't know, often we can't know, in life, whatever it is. And so, but it's really hard for a lot of people, particularly people who are prone to anxiety, to, to let go of that, that need to control. So that's just one thing to, to notice. The other thing, that you're, what you were saying about, do you have to be sitting to practice mindfulness? The answer is not at all. You don't have to be sitting, you don't have to be quiet, you don't have to have your eyes closed. Um, mindfulness is this state of being, like I said, this state of being in your body, being your breath, being aware. So sometimes, I'll give an example of kind of the opposite of mindfulness, if you've ever commuted to home, to work, to wherever, and you get from point A to point B and you have no idea what happened in between. I'm sure this is, I'm not the only one this has happened to. Um, that is, you know, your body takes over, right? We can go on autopilot, hopefully, you know. I mean, I guess if you get to point B, nothing really bad happened, hopefully. But you know, and those moments where like you miss your subway stop or you miss your exit because your, your body's doing what it knows to do. If you drive the same way, if you take the same train, but your mind is somewhere else. And so mindfulness is about noticing what's happening at the present moment. Doesn't mean the present moment is necessarily enjoyable or pleasant or quiet. You can practice mindfulness on the subway. I often practice mindfulness on the subway. Sometimes there is literally nothing else to do at rush hour, particularly when you can't move. Um, and so this idea of, and this is a common, a common idea that people have, and you can be in your body, whatever that means for you, feeling the movement of your muscles, feeling your feet on the floor, feeling the sun on your face, all of that is you being connected and grounded. So you can do that when you're hiking. You can do that when you're washing dishes. That's an example that's a really good one. If you're washing dishes, which I do often, I don't have a dishwasher that works, um, this idea that you can be doing 18 other things at once, you know, listening to the TV, listening to music, on a phone call, whatever, or you can just be washing dishes, which means feeling your feet on the floor, feeling the warmth of the water, really connecting with the movement of washing, the bubbles, taking a breath as you do it. And so this thing that you have to do anyway, right, if you don't want to eat off paper plates the rest of your life, can be an experience of staying connected. Because so often, particularly when there's fear and anxiety, we disconnect, it's natural. And so it doesn't mean you have to be present every single second, but it means you can come back. So for some people, that's um, adult coloring books. For some people, that's you know spending time with people who just make them laugh and, and feel joyful. It can be swimming, it can be walking, it can be, you know, for me, it's sunbathing you know, or sometimes standing on the street and just turning my face up to the sun. That's my mindful practice. It doesn't have to be eyes closed in a quiet room. So another question is, do you incorporate meditation when you're practicing mindfulness? So meditation and mindfulness, there's definitely an intersection between the two. So those of you who are, have been exploring this topic, um, and there's a ton of apps and like great tools, resources out there, Mindfulness meditation is, a, is literally pairing the two. So mindfulness meditation, you might, you might really be sitting, tuning in, noticing, accepting, practicing. Meditation is not just mindfulness. So there, meditation goes on and on in a non-secular way. It's still a huge field. Um, loving compassion, kindness, things like that. But yes, there is an intersection, I hope I'm answering the question, there is an intersection between mindfulness and meditation. But mindfulness can stand alone, and meditation can stand alone, or they can meet in the middle. So, so how would you incorporate music mm. into yeah. mindfulness practice or meditation practice? Yeah. So for a lot of people, to sit in silence is really hard. For me, it's hard, it's gotten a little easier, but it's still challenging. And so if you're one of those people who, you know, you've tried to meditate, you've tried to practice mindfulness, and it's just really hard to sit with silence, you can think about um, pairing your mindfulness practice with a piece of music. So there's a bunch of different ways to do this, um, but you can think about pairing it with a piece of music. And I leave that open, particularly if you're not working with someone to craft this, Maybe there's a piece of music that comes to mind that when you hear it, there's just that internal, oh, that sigh of like, okay, here I am. 
I, you know, whatever that is. And so it may not make sense. It may not be, you know, a Vivaldi violin concerto. It may be, I don't know, a James Taylor song or, or whatever. It might be Metallica. Um, so you can pair your mindfulness practice with a song. And by that I mean you use the song as a framework. So however long the song is, just listen. Just listen to the song. And you'd be surprised how hard that is for a lot of people. right? A lot of us listen to music as part of our self-care. We love it. But we're often doing other things. We're you know, checking our email. We're watching TV. We're commuting. What would it be like to just listen, to notice the music? So, in the listening, however long it is, three, four minutes are most songs, which can feel like an eternity, but it's not. Notice the shape of the music. Notice what instruments you hear, um, the volume, the, the words, if there are words. And then notice how the music is impacting, affecting your body. Is it helping you breathe? Have you noticed that your shoulders are dropping? Are you yawning? Like, that's pairing music and mindfulness, right? Rather than music being just this thing that's happening in the background, it's allowing you, however you are at the present moment to meet the music. And it's that, that field in between, I think that's paraphrasing a Rumi quote, um, meeting them in that field in between that can be really, really fruitful. That's just one way to pair. And I see you have some chimes there. Do you use chimes or other? instruments too? Yeah, so I just brought the chimes, um, and only the chimes unfortunately, just for the sake of carrying. But I'll use a lot of different instruments when I'm doing um, a mindfulness experience with clients. Sometimes an ocean drum, sometimes a guitar. Usually things that are um, as unobtrusive as possible, so kind of this idea of like a musical bath, almost. So not something that has rise and fall. Something fairly placid. But that could be many things. Um, a couple of different ways to use the chimes, even just the chimes. So actually, I'll just do a short experiential right now. I'm going to play the chimes three times. And I'm going to invite, I'm going to invite you, I'm going to invite anyone who's listening or watching this later to just listen. And to listen until you can't hear the sound anymore and just see what, see what you notice. So allowing yourself to take a breath in and a breath out. And so in this act of just slowing down, sometimes that might be the way that I start with a client. I might, I might play it, I might invite them to play it. But just the act of slowing down and listening is something we don't often have the experience of in our day-to-day -day lives. And sometimes people say, oh, I'm here. Like, I drop back down into my body, out of my head. And that's just a good place to start. So um, a couple of questions. Do you incorporate aromatherapy into your practice? And do you think it would help mindfulness or meditation? Um, I don't incorporate it with clients. I'm not a clinical aromatherapist, um, so that's a really important distinction. I, but I'll talk to clients about what scents they use. I personally use essential oils for my own self-care. Um, and so sometimes it just comes up naturally when we're talking about mindfulness. And again, that's a really individual thing. Um, certain people can be very sensitive to certain smells, so that's something to be careful about, but I believe it can be helpful. 
So someone uh, from Hospital Britannica, Buenos Aires, is asking, how do you measure the effects of the intervention? Which intervention? <laughs> All of them? Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, in this moment, how do you measure the effects of this particular intervention are going to be very different than an intervention that I would do in a hospital um, with someone who maybe their heart rate is up. So if someone's attached to, and there are a lot of studies uh, about, there are a lot of studies about music therapy, um, and a lot of studies that show changes in different physiological markers. Um, I don't have clients hooked up to, you know, heart rate machines or blood pressure or anything like that. That's not really in line with how I work. I don't know that, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't think that anyone in private practice really does that, but certainly in, an hosp in a hospital setting, if someone's already hooked up, you can watch the monitors and you get that immediate feedback of is this helping, is this not, as well as verbal feedback from the client if they're able to give that. Um, but I hope that kind of answers the question. This, is, this was just really a very simple intervention. If I was working with, I've done some hospital work. If I was working in a hospital, I might play for a little bit longer. I would allow however the, the patient presents to influence what I play, and I'd likely have more with me than a set of chimes. I'd probably have a guitar and an ocean drum at the very least. Okay, and Maria, if that answered your question, that's great. If you want to submit another question, yeah, go for it. And someone is asking where where can you buy a good set of chimes? <laughs> that's a great question. Um, this set, which I'm hoping came through um, the way that I hear it in person here, um, this set is from Woodstock Chimes, which is a company upstate um, in Woodstock. <laughs> Yeah, in Woodstock, New York. Um, you can find them online, and I believe you can buy all of their products online. I'm not partnered with them. I get nothing from saying that. These are just the chimes that I personally use. Um, yeah, anything anything that comes from a, probably from a company that is involved in you know meditation supplies, they also do like gongs and bells and wind chimes. Um, you pay a little more for quality with instruments, and it's usually worth it. And I usually like things that I can try or that have been recommended to me because there's a lot available online. So when uh, when people come to you to work on issues, I mean, what's why do they come to you? Oh, eighty percent of the time, if I had to pick an arbitrary number, it's anxiety uh, or a mix of anxiety and feeling stuck, and the two are so connected, right? Anxiety leads to same patterns, same behaviors, kind of that, that cycle. But yeah, I specialize really in working with women who have anxiety and who want to make changes and who maybe have tried other things but are feeling stuck. Someone's asking, what are some long-term physical benefits of mindfulness? So I'm not gonna parrot all of the research. Um, John Cabot's in particular has done a lot of research with veterans, I believe with uh, people who've suffered traumatic brain injury. There's a lot of research out there. Um, practicing mindfulness helps reduce different stress markers in the body, um, improves immune function, all of that. But that could be easily uh, found online. I don't have it all memorized. Um, he's been doing research at the University of Massachusetts since the 70s. So there's a lot of research out there about mindfulness. So maybe tell us a little more about working with people with anxiety. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about it before, and I use the word control, <laughs> which is something we all want to do. Of course. It's very difficult to do. Uh, yeah, right? yeah. So maybe a better word is manage, or? There's a lot of words. I mean, <laughs> there are a lot of words. The way that I work, and this is not, certainly not how every therapist works with anxiety, the way that I work is kind of a two-part process. We need to be able to find a place of calm enough. And so for a lot of my clients, that's where we start. You can't do any deep, lasting work 
if you're so anxious that it's hard to sit still, right? And so it's about developing kind of a toolbox of coping skills, right? Doing things that might look like this, maybe doing some breathing exercises, um, simple music and imagery stuff to develop a little bit of a toolbox, um, change some of the thoughts around anxiety. But beyond that, anxiety, there's always a reason, right? Even for the people who come in to see me and say, I've been anxious my entire life, this is just how I am. There's always a reason. And so once my clients feel calm enough, strong enough, resourced enough, emphasis on the enough part, um, we can do some of the deeper below the soil work, I sometimes call it, <clears throat> of figuring out what is the anxiety about? And sometimes it might be, you know, the answer might be as clear as it's because of my cancer diagnosis, but there's layers below that, right? Even with someone with a cancer diagnosis, it's what's gonna happen to my kids? What do I tell my kids? How does this change my identity as, as a woman, as a partner, as a, as a you know, Anxiety and cancer diagnosis and anything that happens health-wise changes our identity, and that's huge. And so that's a lot of the deeper work that can happen. And so, and we dip in and out. So on any given day, if a client comes in and they're just in a little more anxious place, we'll stay in that resourcing area, right? Supporting those, those positive resources. And if they're feeling strong enough, again, the emphasis on enough, we might dip into the kind of the under the, the soil work. Does that kind of answer your question? Mm -hmm. I can say more about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I like the idea of the toolbox, mm -hmm. right? And you know, one of the things that we do here at SHARE when we're talking on the helpline or talking with support groups with women who are newly diagnosed or diagnosed with you know, static disease after early stage diagnosis and then dealing with this constant sort of fear and anxiety. And we talk about that they can do, or techniques that they can utilize to help, I'm not going to say control, yeah. um, <laughs> live with, say control. You know, man manage. manage, yeah, absolutely. And, um, and someone once told me that, you know, they sort of name the anxiety mm -hmm. or the fear, yep. and so when, you know, in a state of mindfulness, if it comes up, yeah. they can name it, and they'll say something like, oh, there you are yeah, again, fear. Absolutely. I see you, I feel you, I acknowledge you, mm -hmm. and now I'm going to release you. And it helps people sort of visualize it. Yeah. And Otherwise, it's just this kind of amorphous thing. So absolutely, when that happens a lot in session, whatever it is, fear, anxiety, a lot of times, you know, if I'm asking a client, okay, let's settle in, let's do just a guided relaxation. They might ask for it when they come in, work has been hectic. And I'll say, what do you notice? oh, there's a tightness in my chest. And so rather than trying to just like kind of soothe that away or, you know, calm that, we'll go into it a little, particularly if I have a relationship with them. And um, and I'll say, okay, tell me about that. What is, what's the sensation? You know, where in your chest? Oh, it's right here. What's the sensation? Oh, it's kind of prickly. I'm just making this up in a moment. It's kind of prickly. Um, does it have a color? Does it have a shape? And so then we can externalize, like you were saying, we can externalize this. So it's not, it's all in me, I don't know what it is, or I do know what it is and it scares the crap out of me, but we can externalize it. And then we might take it one step further, we can give it a name, absolutely. Um, in my office, there, there's a ton of instruments, obviously there's also a lot of scarves, brightly colored scarves, there's also a box of figures and animals. And so I might say, is there a figure or an animal that reminds you of this feeling? and they'll pick one or several, and then you can kind of look at that experience, that feeling as separate from yourself, get a little perspective, have a little distance, right? And so when we're living with constant fear and anxiety, it just permeates everything on every level, right? Physical, emotional, social, everything. And so being able, and then we can work with it kind of as a projective object, it's known often in therapy. So that's that deeper work. But being able to separate from it is where it starts. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I believe in your bio, I mm -hmm. said the words messy play. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> sure. Um, messy play. Yeah. So I, you know, I work primarily with women who present as really 
present really well to the world, right? Everyone thinks that they've got it all together, and they do. I'm not saying they don't. But I think women, for the most part, and people in general, we, as we become adults, we don't let ourselves play. And so if we think about what play is for children, it's a chance to be spontaneous, to be creative, to be messy. If you've ever you know, seen a kid play, most children do not play in an orderly, kind of methodical fashion. There's just toys and costumes everywhere. And we lose that as we get older. Um, we, you know, we might explicitly or implicitly, implicitly get messages of, you know, playing is for kids. Um, you know, you have to be an adult now, whatever it is. And so this idea of messy play, of being able to make mistakes, of being able to improvise, that's something that I, that comes into sessions really naturally given the medium that I work with. But it's something that I believe that we have to be able to not know the outcome, right? There's, there's a metaphor there, right? We have to, you know, be able to pick up a drum and just play because what's the worst thing that'll happen, right? Especially with music, it's, it's fleeting, it's gone. And so if you do it wrong, first of all, who's to say what wrong is? It's not for me to say. And it's gone and you've survived. And there's a metaphor there of I can create, I can be messy, I can be spontaneous, and it's freeing. And so that, the longer that I do this work, the more I believe in that. And I see that carry over into my clients' lives when they come in and say, you know what? I had a confrontation with my boss and I didn't know what I was gonna say, but I just grounded my feet and I went for it and it was fine. It wasn't perfect. We're not going for perfect, we're going for good enough. So if there are any other questions from anyone listening, go ahead and submit them now. And um, so, you know, I think you gave some really great examples of how people can practice mindfulness, um, you know, help manage some of the fear and anxiety. Any other tips? Mm. I mean, I have, let's see, I can share a couple of quick experientials if you'd like. Yeah. Maybe that would be rather than explaining it, I could just show. Uh -huh. So I mentioned toning before. Um, if you've ever gone to a yoga class and if they do an ohm at the end, that's toning. And so another way to, to practice mindfulness is through sometimes through doing a little bit of vocal sounds. And I know this might sound scary, but it doesn't have to be. And so when we think about connecting to the breath, I talked before about tuning in to each inhale, each exhale, for some people, it helps focus their mind and come to stay in the moment to have a sound on the exhale. And so that can look like, and if you're watching, you can do this with me because nobody's gonna hear you. I'm certainly not gonna hear you. It can look like this. So I'm just gently humming, and the idea is that everything remains as soft as possible. And it's a chance to tune into your body. If you do this and your jaw is locking down and your shoulders are tight, so there's just this gentle hum riding out on top of your breath. And I'll often say, when you inhale, you take in what you need, whatever that is. And as you exhale, you release whatever it is you don't need from your body, from your mind. And so let's, I'm gonna do three. I'm gonna invite you to, to do it with me as soft as you'd like. And side note, if you hum on the subway when it's moving, nobody hears you. <laughs> I've tried this often. And so we'll just do three, just to demonstrate what it can sound like. You can hum at any pitch. So this is where my voice wants to end up. If your voice is a little lower, it's fine. If it's a little higher, also fine. It'll change throughout the course of the day often. And so it's not about what it sounds like, it's about how it feels. You want it to feel as relaxed and as much of a release as possible. And so your breath doesn't have to, your exhale doesn't have to last as long as mine does. It's just going for how it feels rather than how it sounds. And so notice if that judgmental voice is popping up. So I'll do three just to demonstrate. And I'll do them at a variety of pitches just so you can hear. And so I always just come back to my breath first. <sighs> exhale, ground through my feet, taking an inhale. different parts of your body. You can move your hands around. Mm -hmm. 
to allow yourself to notice any vibrations, any sensations in your body. Like I said, you might notice sensation in really anywhere, but often lips, teeth, tongue, cheeks, uh, chin, jaw, around your heart, your chest, your belly. And so that's just a way in the moment to be in your body. That's mindfulness, just noticing where you're feeling the sensation. If you don't feel anything, that's okay too. If you're feeling it in the tips of your ears, which I've had people say to me, that's okay too. Uh, it's about practicing just staying with your breath and your body. So you'll notice it'll feel different, like I said, different times a day. You can try that sitting, laying down, walking, um, any variation of just, you know, in the shower can feel really nice, and sound different. Um, and I did mention toning. Toning is just opening up that experience into a vowel sound. So you can do an ah, you can do an oo or an e. And the ah um, would just sound like this. Ah. Uh, same idea. Some people like the humming. It's a little more internal, quieter. Some people like the release of the ah. So it's just options. It's something you can do anywhere, anywhere, anytime. Anywhere. Yeah, and so you can do that anywhere. It can be as small as three breaths. And so as busy as we all are, everyone has three breaths worth of time. And you can pair it with something else. So it can be while you're walking. Uh, sometimes I'll do it if I'm driving at a stoplight, because what else are you going to do at a stoplight anyway? Um, and, it's, and sometimes I'll notice that my shoulders are really high. So doing that brings everything down a little bit on the subway, um, you know, on a quick lunch break, really anywhere. And again, if you're humming, especially if you're soft, no one's going to hear it but you. And I always say if you're doing it on the subway, I mean, we're in New York City, so a lot of us spend time on the subway. If you're doing it on the subway when the subway is moving or on the platform when the train is pulling in, nobody's going to hear you. And even if they do, it's probably not the weirdest thing that's happening on the subway. So what's the best way for someone to get started in a mindfulness practice or meditation or using music? Yeah, so if you'd like to get started in a mindfulness or meditation practice, um, there are a lot of good apps out there for those of you who use smartphones, have an iPad. Um, I personally use Insight Timer, that's I-N-S-I-G-H-T, Timer. Um, there's a lot of other ones. Um, Headspace is a popular one. Calm. And it's really about finding what works for you. I've heard from, from people they really love one, they really hate another. The nice thing about Insight Timer is that while it has guided stuff, um, so you can just push a button and hear five minutes of someone talking you through it, and so that can kind of approximate a session. There's also a feature where you can set your own time and you can choose like the sound of a singing bowl or a chime to begin and end. So that's what I usually use. You can pick literally a minute. I can't keep time in my head for anything. And so uh, you can get a sound at the beginning. It would sound like that. And then you can pick a sound to happen during the minute, the five minutes. And so there's options, uh, nature sounds, water sounds, piano. And then at the end of whatever time you've chosen, it'll sound again. So that's kind of a nice option. Um, and if you are always with your phone, then you always have that capability. Um, as far as pairing music and mindfulness, like I said before, a really good way to get started is to pick a piece of music that you really love for whatever reason. You don't have to know why, just something that you gravitate towards. And if you don't know what that is, spend some time with your music. Um, but I would imagine that everyone has at least one thing that's just like, oh, that's my go-to and just listen to it and notice the sounds, notice the shape of the music and notice how your body feels, if there are any images or thoughts that come to you. And if you're into you know, journaling or making art, sometimes that's a way to start, but you can just notice the music and that's a really good way to start. And that can be your consistent um, music and mindfulness practice. So I'll, I go through phases personally, but I usually have one song that's kind of my go-to, and and pretty much every day I'll spend time just to listen to that and do nothing else. And that's mindfulness, just being in the moment, noticing. So how how long might you work with someone who is dealing with anxiety? I mean, you're talking about their different 
different levels and that you know you kind of dig deeper because with the cancer diagnosis obviously there's going to be fear and anxiety yep. but there are more levels of that so how long do you often work with people it depends I mean it depends what sometimes I've had people come in and want to do a short kind of bit of work together and then as they feel better they stay so I they want they're inspired to do like deeper work um, work with a lot of women who have early attachment wounds of some kind and so that does require some deeper work and that has fed into their anxiety and so it's all connected um, I personally work with people like I said for a long time but a long time is a subjective thing it can be six months it could be three years I have some clients who come in for 10 sessions we do great in-depth work they're ready to do the work whatever that means we do 10 sessions and that's it. I have some people who I've been working with for a few years. And the work changes and shifts over time. So what started out as calming anxiety can become really something in by the end of a therapy, something different by the end of a therapy process. And again, like I said at the very beginning of this, um, the way that I work is really a co-creative process. So my clients and I talk about like, what are we working on right now? Is this feeling good? Do you want to keep going in this direction? And when it's time to end, we talk about that and we process that. And as well as you know providing therapy, I also do workshops and retreats and kind of one-off experiences, um, one-off opportunities rather to experience this kind of work. So often people who may already be in therapy are not looking for therapy right now, but want to improve their wellness. And so that's work that's more at a supportive level, but really powerful. Mm -hmm. So if anyone is interested in getting in touch with you, how can they do that? Yeah, so anyone can go to my website, which is www.maya, M-A-Y-A, Benatar, B-E-N-A-T-T-A-R.com. You can learn more about me and my practice, and there's a contact um, tab at the top. You can send me a message through there, and my phone number is on there as well. And are you on social media as well? I am. <laughs> yes, I am on Facebook, um, I'm on Twitter, and I'm on Instagram. I'm spending most time probably lately on uh, Facebook and Instagram. If you just search Maya Benatar, uh, you should be able to find me. And so come hang out with me. <laughs> See pictures of my office and um, how I take care of myself. I, I'm pretty open, especially on Instagram, with sharing what fuels me and what inspires me to do this work and what keeps me going as well as funny stuff, because everybody's funny <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and your YouTube channel, they can just go to YouTube and search. And search Maya name. Benatar, yeah. And if anyone has difficulty finding any of these, you can go to my website and send me a message and I'll send you a direct link. Great. Great. Uh, we still have a couple of minutes left. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any more questions coming in. There's a comment, nice. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. <laughs> but I don't think I missed any questions. I'm always happy to, to answer questions, um, and maybe if questions get shared, you, they can be passed along to me. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming in. I really pleasure. appreciate it. I love learning about the process. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks.